I've got six <laughs> years of physics behind my belt and several years of machine learning, and I'm still intimidated on a regular basis. It is just something you need to be okay with being on okay with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's part of the fun of it, overcoming that. Welcome and, back, everybody, to Cradle to Grave R. My name is Mark Gingrass. Today, I have a special guest on the show. I'm going to do an interview with a data analytics developer slash machine learning engineer enthusiast slash physicist slash just an all around great guy. So stay tuned. We're gonna talk about all kinds of things like career, what is machine learning, what kind of complexities do you run into in the real world, not just academia, and how can you possibly get to a place where he's at now? And is he happy? We're gonna talk about all those things. Before I get started though, please subscribe below if you like this type of content. Um, it doesn't just help me out, it helps you out because YouTube will look at that data cluster of what kind of content do I produce, mostly R programming, right, in this channel. And it'll recommend really good R channels right next to mine. So you're gonna find other channels that are relevant, you'll find more videos of me, so please subscribe and check out this video, interview, and uh, comment below if you have any questions. I'd love to have more guests on the show, so. So, all right, well, let me welcome you to, this is the Cradle to Grave R channel, which I know you don't do R, uh, but you, you do a lot of work with uh, data, nonetheless. Your, uh, your name is Alex, Alexander or Alex? Alex. Alex, Alex Sage. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you because I know that your, your professional job is to actually work with data and manipulate it and do things with it. So I was going to ask you, I guess my first question would be, uh, what type of work do you do? What do you classify yourself as with a title? And how long have you been doing it for? Yeah, so I've been, uh, let's start with like current uh, is the best way to approach that. Right now I'm a bit of a machine learning engineer, mostly just trying to get into the field. I uh, got a nice opportunity from a boss who threw me a project that, wasn't extremely well funded, so it was a good way for me to like get my feet wet in it. And uh, I've been going off of that for a while and working on that for a couple of years, doing my best with that and learning a lot in terms of online courses and stuff. I do have uh, a good bit of coding background. I have done a little bit of R, not much. I've done pretty much every coding language that I've heard of, at least for a couple of weeks at some point. And really happy to kind of settle into the machine learning world. It's a, it's a pretty weird and interesting place that I'm excited to really dive into even harder with my next job. That sounds good. And most of your, your machine learning is done in uh, Python? Yeah. And with yeah, the, most of it's in Python with the uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow, package. okay. Yeah. Interesting. I want to, I know I want to dive into a lot of different things and we, we can kind of, maybe we'll do this multiple times, but, um, one of the things I want to talk about, and I think you wanted to talk about it too, is some of the complexities of, of even getting access to data to use. Can you talk about some of your problems that you might have had gaining access to data? Yeah, data is kind of the central point when you're starting a new machine learning project, and it's something that's really hard to understand what that means until you really are faced with the same challenge. My first exposure actually to machine learning was in grad school. I took a little course just for fun and my TA was just like, just choose your good data, choose good data, choose your data properly. And I was like, I don't know what that means. You know, like <laughs> it was my first engineering course ever. And he's just like, don't choose bad data. And I'm just like, you need to be so much more specific about that. <laughs> I do not know what you're saying. Um, so yeah, it's such an enormous thing and it will really define how your project goes, but I, I'm sure it's invariant depending on the organization that you work for. There's always in large organizations a lot of people that have some fear of things going wrong, and so if you want to get access to data, then there's definitely going to be some hoops to jump through, and there's, there's a lot of people that don't know about machine learning yet or don't know how practical you can get from start to production or what the advantages are. So that's also a tough sell sometimes as well to get people to understand why you're even trying to get access to the data in the first place to even start the argument of why you should have access. So what's what's funny is you have you have to you have to get the access 
And then once you get the access, you get a, you realize how bad the data even is. So then there's all kinds of cleanup that you have to do, right? Before you even do any machine learning. Yeah, it's, it's a real big mess with a lot of teams and projects. It's a, a really interesting, interesting thing because there's so many different tutorials and stuff online and any kind of class I've taken, they, they may give you like difficult data or something, but they always give you data that where, it, where it's possible to do like one little image processing transformation or uh, a little bit of like cleanup to just remove all the like noise with this one filter. And then you can get nice clean data that you only train on in your single crappy laptop and the machine learning works out. Okay. But uh, <sighs> yeah, in, in real life, it's, it's definitely a challenge to understand. Like you have this plethora of poor quality data. How do you get a good machine learning model? That's not just trained on bad data. That's going to be a bad model. You know, that was a really complex question to answer. That, that does lead to, you know, how do you even begin to try to explain that to a manager uh, that, hey, this is going to take so long and they think that it's just a matter of plugging this data into an algorithm. Do you, have to, do you find yourself having to explain that or do you work for <laughs> your organization understands that that takes, too, that takes a long time to do, to curate? Yeah, I think one of the first things that you should do when you're in a project where it's not focused on machine learning around you. You know, the project was created for machine learning for you. You're not at Google that has a heavy machine learning experience already. One of the first things you should do is try to make some kind of ROI investment or ROI argument. You know, make some kind of argument why it's really important so that you don't have to keep coming back to it. Make it clear and understood by everyone, likely even document it and make a couple simple diagrams that can be easily shareable. I think that would be a really good idea for anyone getting started in the project. Like even if people are telling you, you know, they want to start seeing results as soon as possible, just say no. You know, like we need to <laughs> we need to make it clear so that everyone can understand in really simple terms why this is important. Start to understand how big the impact is on terms of the number of users and well really just the number of user hours that your machine learning project or results are going to go towards and the potential benefits and the challenges that those users face. Uh, can you explain to like a layman the differences between, I don't know, maybe data analytics, machine learning, and AI in like layman's terms? Yeah, so I would say data analytics is a lot more in the realm of like a data science job. So data analytics is going to be more of, you have some data, it could be in terms of like business analytics where you're just trying to make some data extremely understandable to people that aren't used to interpreting complex data arrangements, or it could mean you have a stats degree and the wealth of complexities that come behind doing R of stats you know, in terms of really analyzing and understanding different things like that. I mean, return on investment is often a more of a stats question that's uh, tied with business, so that would be more that sector. And you're probably also dealing a lot with SQL databases and things like that. It's just real hard raw data making graphs and getting an understanding. And then you would have machine learning, which is more like your predictive algorithms. You know, Netflix tells you what you want to watch when you go check it out tonight. That's not randomly picked. That's machine learning that has created a profile around you based on what you like and matched it with other movies or TV shows that are things you like. Same with uh, every kind of website you can think of. You know, Amazon, Google uses that for its search engines. Obviously, you have the cool ones like Tesla, Autopilot, driving around. But for the most part, most machine learning in the world is on your websites, your Etsy, your Instagram, whatever it is, trying to recommend you content to look at. And then artificial intelligence is, it's not really something that, exists right now it it's kind of just something that we're looking towards and it's a really interesting argument between like the field specific subfield i'm in in machine learning right now natural language processing 
some people uh, talk a, about a similar branch off field called natural language understanding. And that would be like the AI's ability to grasp the concept of language. So like you can think of natural language understanding as just like this one part of the whole AI's brain because AI would also need to be able to, you know, be plugged into a robot and have some kind of understanding of the objects around it. So like the language component would be just that one part. And a lot of people argue that we don't even have natural language understanding yet, even though some people claim to be working in that field because it, it's really hard to define what an understanding of a word is, you know, just because... Right. A robot can talk back to you. Does that really mean that it understands the language properly? There's all, there's this really great example that they talk about in this podcast. I love where you can write a sentence and you can write out "I love America," and it'll be able to understand that that sentence is a positive sentence about the United States. But if you write "I love Turkey," there's so much negative news articles around the country Turkey that it inherently assumes that you hate the country. It just throws away the word love because the word turkey is so embedded in its experience with negativity that it can't grasp the concept that you would love turkey. <laughs> that's <a laughs> that's pretty... like impossible for it to grasp. So that's one of the like go-to arguments for why we don't actually have natural language understanding and therefore have no component in that sense of artificial intelligence because <laughs> any algorithm we have, no matter how sophisticated it is, can be broken in that way. You can just like tweak a word in one little way and it just kind of throws the whole thing for a loop. Yeah. I've heard of like some of the image processing stuff that, uh, the guys do, they'll, they'll find ways to break it without making the image really look different to a human, like a picture yeah. of a cat. The machine learning can look at this picture of a cat a hundred thousand different ways and it works. It's always a cat, right? It's pretty good. Yeah. But now they have people that are reverse engineering even, I guess not, maybe that's the wrong term, the cat, because yeah. they know what the machine's really doing uh, in a way. I mean, I know you don't know what's inside that black box, so to speak, but yeah. they can trick it by just tweaking something in that cat picture that a human can't see, but it screws up the machine completely. Even though it picked out all of the cats correctly every time, they purposely manipulated the cat to not be detectable by that particular machine learning algorithm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a whole field of people that do that kind of stuff. And yeah, the example I gave is the exact analogy in terms of language versus the one you gave, which is in terms of images. Yeah, there's they just create a little algorithm that throws a little bit of noise on and like it changes a couple pixels to zeros maybe. And then the natural and then the uh, neural network inside the black box that you mentioned just goes, I don't know what this is. You know, it throws its hands up completely. <laughs> really weird. I, I was trying to explain the black box thing to some somebody, and I'm I'm just a layman myself. Like I don't do this for a living, but I was I was trying to explain that it's really not necessarily a black box, so to speak. It's just you can't make an equation out of all of those billions of ones and zeros. Because you can always extract the ones and zeros that are inside that that algorithm. But the question is, can you? The way that the algorithm is created is hard to duplicate sometimes because you have different hardware, you have different things going on. And so if one little bit was flipped during that creation process, you might get two different algorithms that are very similar, right? Um, that's the way I was kind of explaining it was you can have an equation with 200 million variables. Well, who's going to write that out? That's why it's a black box. Nobody can really understand 200 million variables. Is that even yeah. close to correct? or? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely... After it's trained, after your black box, which is often like a pseudonym for a neural network, is trained, then you can definitely write the equation for it. But the problem is that in a lot of normal areas of science, you have theorists that write the equation that should describe the situation, and then experimentalists that match data to that exact equation. And what you have in like machine learning for neural networks is you have this this complex and oftentimes most of the time enormous amount of variables that's is more than you need to solve the problem and what you're really doing is you're kind of like overfitting to the data with this function that has just a million different peaks and troughs and I, I don't know what your average user's comfort with 
uh, like finding local minima versus global minima would be, but that that is a really great reference to this conversation because you end up creating a function in your neural because of your neural network that has just a million local minima when you really maybe only wanted one global minima and that variety mm -hmm. and possible ways to solve the same answer is where the problem comes in. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned a lot from listening to this podcast uh, from this OC Devel. Uh, this guy, he's just, he's probably a young 20 something year old, you know, and uh, he talks about machine learning and, and he talks about gradient descent and finding that, finding those local, local, minimas and, and global minimas and, and how just that alone is a whole field in itself. How do you get to yeah. the, the most local minima? And I guess, I think my audience for this channel is, uh, it varies widely. It does. I've, I got a lot of PhDs that are in there looking to just build websites using uh, R Markdown and Hugo um, and Blogdown. And then I have people that are very much just beginners. So it's across the board. For, for, for my audience, but for, for anyone talking about finding the local minima is, it, I'm thinking about calculus a lot. Like you, you have the, yeah. uh, like a curve and you're looking for the very bottom piece of that curve. But why yeah. are we, look, why are we looking for that local minima? What does that, what does that give you? Yeah. Um, so in a, uh, if you're thinking back to your calculus courses that maybe you took, <laughs> then you can think about, say, trying to if you're trying to solve a problem, you're often trying to find when the function like hits zero, right? So maybe your ideal situation, it only hits like the zero mark. There's only two correct answers at two points. And so what you would typically want for that is you would want to choose a function with like the lowest order polynomial, the simplest function you can that would fit that and get those exact answers that you want. And so you would end up fitting like a parabola. It would just be a function with like x to the power 2. That would pretty much be it. But when you throw in a neural network, it's like training a function that has like a seventh order polynomial when there's really only two points that you have to intersect with. So a seventh order poly polynomial is going to have six like troughs. It's going to have a lot of different inflection points. It's going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's going to cross those two points, but it's also going to go up and down a lot of other times. And when we say it makes that transition, when it transitions from going up to going down, we call that like an answer. So it's going to give you like six possible answers when you really only wanted two. And if you only test those two, then you don't know like how much variety it accepts and that's why you can get weird situations like you're talking about before with the image where like you can throw images at it that still look like a cat and basically nothing has changed and doesn't get it or you can throw images at it where it doesn't look at all like a cat and it still think it's, thinks it's a cat because it's not it's not a function that's specifically written for your task it's a function with way too many answers that just happens to almost always work on your context i think if i remember correctly though um the there's a there's an amount of error that you receive and you can measure and you say hey i i tried this this equation or this model this neural network model and then since i know the answer i can i can verify it and then that verification process is you want the least amount of error and so finding the minima i think in my head is you know, can you find a, an, a better model that has even less of an error? But to do that, it takes time and it takes processing power and money, right? And so there's a certain point where you just have to say that's good enough, right? And a lot of these models. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And one of the complexities in evaluating your final model is the fact that you end up in machine learning having this pipeline and even when you're evaluating the actual model itself, you have multiple kind of functions that are returning different answers. So because you're looking at kind of different functions that are all related to evaluating your machine learning model, then you can actually be talking about different minima and maxima. So when you talk about trying to minimize, minimize the error of 
the results or like predictions of your machine learning model, that's actually a different function than you would be talking about if you're making the analogy to say curve fitting, which is like a standard statistical practice that I don't know, you may have an R video on? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm, up to, I'm up to about 101 videos. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's funny. Your specialty that you're probably the most you've worked on was natural language processing, and NLP is what people refer it to usually. Um, can you give a couple of examples of what that, uh, what, is, what does that mean, natural language processing? What kind of outcomes are you looking for? What does that all mean? Yeah, so it spans a pretty wide variety of contexts. I mean, these days it's starting to become integrated into a lot of the things that we do. I'm sure you've noticed if you have Gmail that it's started to auto predict your sentences. And not just like you've typed two letters of a three le letter word, I know what you're going to say next on your phone. This, you know, this is very smart and complex. It's trying to finish your entire sentence for you, right? Yeah, and That's I love pretty, it. <laughs> It's pretty awesome and ridiculous, and Google has a lot of computational power, and that is natural language processing. Google is, it's it's almost uncomparable in terms of how experienced they are with natural language processing techniques. They've written most of the uh, big name articles on it and stuff like that. So it's in terms of understanding what your search result would be. You know, like you type in, a fraction of a sentence that's grammatical nonsense and they convert that into a core concept that they then compare to a bunch of different web pages or it's in terms of Siri or whatever like desktop little mini AI that you might have to order I, I don't I don't have one of those things order your groceries <laughs> or find out what the weather is <laughs> uh, it you know it has to interpret no matter how you phrase that sentence no matter what words you use what you're trying to say and it also has to understand a variety of accents. That's a very nonlinear problem that's really difficult and basically impossible to handle in normal coding methods. So you use neural networks to abstract it and get the general idea of what the person's trying to say and then just repeat back to them the answer that you have in. So the, the natural language processing, I, in my head, I don't know why, but I felt like, oh, that's text, that's text. but are you talking about vocal, like the actual vocal? Is that part of natural language processing, or is that completely separate? Are they two different things? They, yeah, they would be two different uh, industries, but, and I'm sure there's some people that wouldn't be happy with me saying this, <laughs> conversion of audio to text is a pretty solved problem. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's something we've been working on for a long time. I think we're pretty good <laughs> at it. So I was just, I was trivializing that. I was <laughs> assuming that had already been done. <laughs> That's a good point because I use it all the time actually. Sometimes I make closed captioning and I just use, uh, I was using a, a site that's pretty cheap. <laughs> I found out you could do it with Microsoft Word pretty easily too. <laughs> <laughs> so. I didn't know that, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a feature of functionality that's being integrated all over the place because that's how relatively standard it is these days. But getting that final text and then understanding how to form a grammatically correct sentence that's an appropriate response to that text is still a difficult challenge. It's, it's, it's crazy because I know you don't have to understand all of the math, but you have to understand kind of the math concepts, like um, all the words, every single letter, every character is represented by, by digits somehow because the computer does yeah. computations on digits, right? Or on zeros and ones yeah. ultimately, but like to say that, hey, what's the opposite of king? Oh, queen. How would you know that? You know, you, you, you've sucked in all of this data. How, how does it even begin to know that the opposite of king is queen? Is there any way to answer that, like, kind of quickly? <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you know, right? Like, hmm. you don't know because someone sat down with a dictionary of all the words with you when you were a child and kind of taught you what... But, First, logic is <laughs> basic <laughs> mathematics, and then then taught you how to go through the dictionary and understand the relationships between words. I mean, you, just as any other human, learned it from context. You heard sentences and you saw results, and you did that over and over again for years, and you got better at it. It's like people kind of downplay 
how well machine learning algorithms work these days because they're not remotely comparable to human capacity. But I think it's an extraordinarily unfair thing to do to say that a human has been exposed to language for eight years of its life and an algorithm has been exposed to language for a month of nonstop training and all of a sudden this algorithm is supposed to be like just as intelligent as that eight-year-old child. It, that seems a little unfair in my yeah, that's actually interesting. And then the the amount of energy that eight year old had to get and gain throughout eight years of its life, that's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of apples and bananas and whatever. Then and and, you, and so the power consumption of that eight year old was way higher. And it's bad for the environment. We should just use machines. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Training models is actually pretty terrible for the environment. Uh, that's true. <laughs> I don't know uh, if you looked into that, but some models that are trained are worse than the carbon footprint of an entire automobile over its lifetime. It's, oh, wow. it's pretty massive. It's definitely not insignificant. <laughs> I mean, you hear about a lot of the um, Bitcoin mining and how they're using yeah. all these, all their GPU power and electricity is like hard. It's expensive. So the, yeah. their goal would be to, you know, produce more Bitcoins. I don't know anything about Bitcoin really, but to, to mine more Bitcoins than it costs you to pay the electric bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's a funny optimization function there. <laughs> So with machine learning, um, I know that a lot of people that are in like the theory part of it, they, they do a lot of computational like uh, pro problems, in it, but a lot of linear algebra, a lot of matrices, yeah. matrix math versus regular algebraic equations. And that's because of limitations, right? A for loop running through every single cell of a spreadsheet, so to speak, takes a lot longer than if you can do something all at once, or you can also parallelize a lot of matrices, right? You can cut a matrix into a hundred pieces and send all a hundred to a hundred different GPU cores, so to speak. Um, I don't know the terminology, but is that a true statement? And are you starting to learn some of how to do all that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's actually a uh, built in to, I think every operating system, it, it's been a year since I looked into this, but there's these tools that just run on a normal CPU that are optimized for linear algebra operations. And they're kind of like sub-programming level tools that you have to like really know what you're talking about to, to leverage. And they, they heavily are relied on by your computer constantly to perform those matrix multiplications and to really optimize uh, the linear algebra because, yeah, it, Linear algebra is a significant component behind all machine learning work, but one thing I would really stress is uh, that getting into machine learning doesn't require you to be doing that kind of mathematical work on a regular basis. You actually probably shouldn't, because if you are, then, well, you either should be in academia and I shouldn't be talking to you and telling you what to do, <laughs> right. or you're in industry and you're not spending your time efficiently, because... <laughs> Other people have already solved most of those problems, and it's not efficient for you as a person working for a for-profit company to be thinking about that. And that the second thing that I want to say on that matter is that, like, it's it's not something that you should be doing on a daily basis, like I just said. I mean, you often don't even have to read papers doing machine learning because those are often too technical for the practical implementation you're trying to do in the real world. But if you don't understand some level of mathematics, my personal opinion is that you really shouldn't be getting into machine learning. There's a lot of boot camps that are training people to get started in these things and that are really trying to get people started. But if you don't have that kind of STEM background that can get you started, then there's going to be a big uphill battle. You're not going to really understand the intricacies of how to debug certain problems there's going to be certain challenges that you're just not going to be prepared to handle. And that's perfectly okay for some areas of machine learning where the answers and the procedures are going to be cookie cutter, or there's definitely some jobs in the field that would be appropriate for you. But it, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens in a couple of years when there's a lot of machine learning engineers trained from these online programs that don't have any idea what they're doing and can't solve difficult problems. It reminds me of the, the word that they use in, in my industry, which... <laughs> Um, you know my industry. Um, they use a lot of the, the, the word 
this is for data scientists, they say citizen data scientists instead of data scientists to try to make it or democratized data scientists. Everybody can be a data scientist, right? So same thing. I'm glad that you mentioned that about the machine learning engineer or machine learning whatever, um, because that's really important. People want to know, how do I jump into this if I'm just starting out? Do I actually have a chance? Are there jobs? And do I really need a PhD doing this? And you answered yeah. some of that. Do you want to expand on that? or? Yeah, definitely. I, I've been looking at a couple job postings recently, and there's a really interesting trend that makes it clear that people will hire you if you don't have a formal education. I just saw the headline. I didn't read it for a new Medium article that Google apparently put out a coursework series that you can take and they promise that they will consider you for application without having a four-year degree just based on going through their coursework. And so there's all sorts of stuff that's happening like this and it's definitely possible to be prepared without doing a four-year degree. I mean, I don't have my four-year degree in coding or machine learning. That's why I said STEM because I'm, that's where I think the bar should be set is to have that kind of scientific experience but there is a huge demand in this industry and it's just going to keep growing there are definitely areas where people are going to be needed that don't need to know how to solve novel problems but still need to do machine learning there's going to be so many different areas of classification problems where you just need someone that knows how to do the coding you know you just need someone that can code that can grab a scikit library and just plug and go some really simple, really nice, good-looking data and then get the answer and pass it on to the next person for production. There's going to be jobs for that. There's going to be jobs for people to help that person because there's all sorts of, like, data munging. People joke is, like, 80% of the job of a machine learning engineer, which there's no math anywhere near data munging. It's just <laughs> painstaking staring at data and organizing it. There are people that are going to be needed, many, many, many people who are going to be needed that need to understand the language of machine learning, who can talk to the machine learning engineer, and who can help out with uh, data transformation, data munging, ETL, any kind of that stuff, any kind of data analysis. And, you know, getting your foot in the door, working with other people, maybe that's a good way to actually expand your horizons. And, you know, you come in there as an ETL guy. Hey, I'm, I know how to move data from point A to B with a little bit of transformation. But I've been working with this machine learning guy. And, you know, that, that's a good career growth, possibly, or a career change, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm a complete advocate for the idea of an apprentice. You know, years of experience can always replace a four-year degree. It just... A boot camp can definitely not replace a four-year scientific degree in terms of how you analytically approach problems. But yeah, if you're working for a company and you have a well-experienced person guiding you and giving you advice on how to tackle difficult analytic problems and start from scratch, then you could definitely gain that experience without that degree. I always tell people, eventually... Um degrees get you in the door a lot of times. It gets your resume looked at. But later on in life, as you grow and you've got projects under your belt, nobody is going to ask Elon Musk where he got his degree. No one's going to ask, you know, all these famous people that, that made it, oh, Bill Gates, where did he get his degree? Who cares? He, he, he was successful with his projects. So what really matters is getting your foot in the door. And if that if that is a degree, that's great, a STEM degree. If it's a boot camp that... Uh, along with some STEM background, that might help. Like you said, um, you need some of that STEM. And I agree with you. Uh, I, I, I'm in that camp as well. I never got a four-year engineering degree, um, but I had f about three years of, elect of electrical engineering and math. So I feel like I can talk the concepts and understand the math, but I can't yeah. do the equations. <laughs> not very well anyways. Yeah, there's not, there's not a huge demand to be able to do a lot of that stuff once you leave, but to be able to understand why some equations are used, like why linear, linear algebra is so helpful to optimize your code, like you mentioned before, you know, it's it's definitely helpful to understand those base concepts of saying that like it's much faster if you can take this vector of all these values and just throw the whole thing into one function 
and it'll just return a matrix of values and answers as opposed to passing in one at a time in a for loop that's just really painfully slow. Just knowing that there's options and some options are faster than others, kind of like in, in maybe like first year um, computer science courses, you have the bubble sort, the quick sort, the recursion sort, knowing that they're all used for different scenarios, just knowing that they exist is what really matters. Not that the math behind it really is just, this one takes a long time on this type of data, this one doesn't. It depends what your outcome is. This one gives you a better result, but it takes five times as long to get there, et cetera, et cetera, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, and I would say one of the biggest things that I'm harping on that STEM degree for for getting good at machine learning from the start, you know, that, like we said, experience can pretty much always substitute for the degree, but understanding thoroughly the concepts of like overfitting and underfitting and analyzing your data and understanding which variables in the machine learning algorithm will contribute to that underfitting and overfitting of the like data that you want is is something that's definitely not trivial and I from my years of like TAing and uh, like tutoring I, I don't believe that the average person can just pick that up after a boot camp. You know, I, I think that's something that, that takes a little bit more exposure than just a couple months in a course. And physically physically doing the work probably helps a lot. Uh, yeah. with, when you say exposure, uh, I know a lot of people read, read a book or they do the quick data camp or whatever they want to do, uh, but then they don't have any projects under the belt that they were really, I guess, in, into you know they just they all do the same was it NIST minds or the uh, data set you know I can convert a bunch of handwritten numbers to uh, actual text or the actual digit um, great so can everybody else do something real world practical that would benefit somebody for a project would would that help <laughs> get your foot in the door yeah yeah there's definitely a lot of great options for that as well you don't have to even take on that challenge as you pitched it like without direction there's lots of people that will give you direction on what to do with that idea that you just pitched there's a really great standard that's already been set in place by open source developers right a lot of open source developers are people that want to get into the field and start by getting into the field by getting to know a package that's for a specific programming language getting to know it really, really in-depthly, and then helping contribute to it and making it better, and then you know expanding on the GitHub as a contributor to that. And if you start applying to a company and you're a contributor to an open source package that they like for that project, I mean, that uh, is like a guarantee in for your job. And that is, if you're in a situation where you don't need income for a little bit of time, you know, if you're looking to just go straight out of your... A uh, gas station job, just quit it, just live with your parents for a couple months, and then just jump straight into a 75k job. If that's what you want, then that's not a bad pathway for you. Find something like that, you know. Find an open source community or team, and just like keep learning it. Find one that's really interesting to you, and just harp on it for hours, for months, until you get really good at it. And then that's the resume that you need. You know, that's that's what people are going to respect. They're going to like something like that. That's 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 great stuff. Um, I guess I don't want to take up too much of your time, but maybe a couple couple more quick easy ones. Like maybe not maybe not so easy, but what where do you what what kind of work do you see yourself doing in the next say say five years from now? What kind of work is your dream job of? This is what I want to do right now. You know, it's a goal of yours. Machine learning will provide me with a job, no matter what data I'm looking at that will be it'll be interesting it will be challenging it will be intimidating and I, I do think it's important to say that explicitly because a lot of people see this and they're just like oh that's intimidating to me i can't get started it's still intimidating to me i've got <laughs> six years of physics behind my belt and several years of machine learning and i'm still intimidated on a regular basis it is just something you need to be okay with being on okay with it <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's part of the fun of it overcoming that and I, my dream job is really just to continue on in this field and all the benefits that the field provide of it. You know, they, 
working for a self-driving car company would be a really cool thing and be like fun to tell people about and it's a pretty like nice concept but in the end of the day machine learning gets you a wonderful salary there's a great move in tech towards valuing the employee and moving from 40 hour work weeks to 30 hour work weeks they almost always give great benefits there's enormous job flexibility in terms of time of day you work and uh, where in the country you work for working remotely like and that's what makes your life happy right going home at the end of a six hour day to whatever city you wanted to live in with a good salary that's going to pay for the roof over your head. Like that's that's more so what's going to make me happy. And I think that's true for most people as well. So I'm going to be pretty sad. I'm pretty stoked about the field. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I really appreciate you uh, doing this interview um, for this art channel. And I think that you're going to motivate and inspire a lot of people to jump out of my art channel and go to Python, but still, <laughs> I think that's great that you, that you did this. I'd love to do it again. We can pick different, um, different topics and, and try this again sometime if you're interested. Is there any last, yeah. last, uh, words you want to throw on before I hit the uh, stop button? Yeah. Just make sure you find something that's interesting. Uh, I'm myself still teaching myself coding and it's important to not force yourself to learn an area of coding. That's not, engaging to you. Just find one that's really interesting and it won't feel like work and it'll go by quicker and easier.